This program is brought to you by Emory University. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. Happy Friday morning. Welcome to 2023 first Friday Fellows Conference of this new calendar year. Um, you can, as you can see, our presenter this morning is Billy Joe Mullinax. Uh, for those who haven't met Billy Joe yet, he is a first year fellow in the clinical track. Uh, he is a native of Honeyapath, South Carolina, which, uh, as luck would have it, is also the hometown of my one of my grandmothers, my paternal grandmother. So we have that in common. Uh, Billy Joe does undergraduate studies at Presbyterian College. Uh, and went to medical school at the Medical University of South Carolina, then came to Emory for his residency. Um, and as you can see, he's going to talk about catheter-induced complete heart block. So take it away, Billy Joe. Thank you, sir. Good morning, everyone. Um, as you can see, we're going to talk about catheterization-induced heart block. But this, this was... Uh, a case I'm happy to share. It ended up being one of the more fun cases I've had so far in fellowship. And I think it was so much fun for me because I was on call the night I got the first call. I happened to be on cath. Um, and I also had some, some weekend coverage. So I, I was kind of involved in this case with multiple touch points. And I found that it uh, kind of allowed me to stretch and grow and um, use many of the things I've learned across several areas related to cardiology, um, as well as to use some of the information I've already learned so far. Uh, you'll, you'll see from one of our chiefs, Maya, I got to use some of the stuff she taught me. And um, yeah, so let's jump on in. Our learning objectives for this talk, uh, as far as the biggest picture are to review the epidemiology of iatrogenic conduction abnormalities, particularly across several different procedures, but we're also gonna compare the anatomical differences of the bundles and see how that contributes to iatrogenic related heart block and other AV conduction abnormalities. And then also discuss uh, briefly spontaneous resolution um, following these procedures. So outline, I'm gonna start with the case, kind of the hook that first got me interested. Uh, then we're gonna jump into uh, anatomy specific uh, epidemiology between different procedures, um, when we're going to pacemaker, as well as some mitigation strategies. Okay, so this case starts like, like many do over here at the VA, and it comes with a, an off-hours page from the ED. The guy, you know, I call him back pretty quickly, and the first thing he says is, hey, I got a guy who has VTAC. He's otherwise hemodynamically stable, and he wanted to know whether or not they could use amiodarone in him. All he knew so far really was that the guy had a potassium greater than six um, or if they should just proceed to cardioversion. Now I mentioned there, he did have some hypotension when he came in, they gave him fluid um, and he was feeling better. So because he was feeling uh, well, he didn't feel bad. I was able to take a little time, but this is the EKG they sent me at first. So this is the first thing they text me. I get this EKG and I'll let you all take a look at it um, for a second here. When I first saw this EKG, my thought was, yes, it's wide, yes, it's fast, but I didn't really think it was VTAC. In fact, I thought it looked more irregular. So I was thinking perhaps this guy could have AFib. I mean, they were telling me that he was hemodynamically stable now, his pressures were better. He was talking, so I didn't think it was VTAC, but it certainly could be. I mean, I wasn't 100% sure, but because he was hemodynamically unstable, I had a few seconds. I pulled up his uh, chart and I was able to get a little information. I mean, they, did, they told me his last four, but they didn't really tell me anything else about this guy. What I learned was he had diabetes, he had hypertension, used to smoke, but we had never gotten a coronary CTA uh, and we had never done a left heart cath on him, no stress test. He did have an echo from a few years back. They said he had a normal EF. And then he had an EKG from the year prior. I looked at this EKG and I saw, you know, right bundle. He had the PVC on it. Um, so I was feeling a little more confident now that perhaps this person already had a conduction abnormality. He was going fast. Maybe he was in new AFib. So maybe this was an SVT with a barency. That's what I was thinking. However, this gave me an opportunity 
to kind of confirm my suspicions using something that Maya had taught us earlier in the year over at Grady. She gave a talk on the Bayesian algorithm. So I looked it up again so I could remember the criteria because I didn't remember them. Um, but I knew it had really one question and then two AKG pieces. So the question was, did the patient have any structural heart disease? Well, I just learned this man didn't. So he wouldn't have gotten any points for that. But I had to look at the EKG and come up with, with these next two questions. I had to look at lead two and lead AVR and determine whether or not uh, it was 40 milliseconds or less. Um, and then that might give me some more confidence in my presumptive diagnosis. So I went back to the EKG. And I, again, I felt like this was right at the line of 40 milliseconds. So at least what I could see, I was giving this guy no points. And based on the basal algorithm, if you have zero to one points, then you're concerned more for an SVT. Two or more points, you're thinking more VTAC. With that being said, um, at this point, I probably would have treated him the same way, which would have been to have given him amyloid run. It's usually kind of what I go to. I would say I'm most familiar and most comfortable with that medication particularly because his pressures have been soft. Now his pressures didn't improve, but they weren't significantly higher. They were in the eighties and nineties systolic now, but he was feeling well. So he got the fluid, like I said, and he improved. Now that pressure of 83 over 57, that was after two liters, what they said, but his pressures really were ranging up into the nineties as well. He got one bolus of amyloid on his pressures, uh, uh, excuse me, his rates, came down from the 140s, 150s into the 120s and 130s. And like I said, his pressures were better. Otherwise, his labs were really most notable for quite a high anion gap, as well as a glucose. He had some beta hydroxy, so they made the diagnosis of DKA in him. Uh, otherwise, he had relatively you know, normal chest X-ray. Now, he got the fluid, his pressures are better, his rates are better. He's talking to the staff still, but now he's telling him he's having chest pain. They didn't tell me he had chest pain before. Now, so this is a little more concerning, particularly because his troponins start coming back. His first troponin is 2.5, and then throughout the night, it goes up to 15. His repeat EKG, as you can see here, uh, is irregularly irregular, slowed down, still wide, but now his T waves look a little more prominent here. I can see them, and anteriorly and laterally, I see more T wave inversions, see them uh, kind of more of a vice basic, but here, and then uh, inverted in one, and then uh, V1 through V3, I see all the T wave inversions. So now I'm more concerned for an in this man. He's complaining of chest pain. He has a metabolic derangement. Uh, he was tachycardic. So I have him on a heparin drip now. Um, his chest pain resolves. It was coming and going through the night, but it had resolved. Um, he gets admitted to the MICU. They treat his DKA with an insulin drip and uh, more fluid. He ended up getting about four liters overall, but in the ED, he got two liters. And I tell him to make him NPO as well as to give him a full dose aspirin. The next morning, you know, since his chest pain had resolved, I see him the next morning, uh, but I'd already planned on going to heart counseling. So I was a cath fellow and the consult team saw him that morning. We get more history from him, and, you know, he's actually been having what he describes as feeling bad. In fact, he came to the ED because he was having left body pain. That's what he says, left body, shoulder, and hip pain. But when you really dig in, you see that really his shoulder and hip pain was old. In fact, he had opiates been prescribed to him and he had been using them more so in the last two weeks because he had been having more left shoulder pain. This also coincided with him not using his insulin regularly in the last couple of weeks. In fact, it was the last couple of days prior to him coming to the ED. He was sitting there. He was talking to his sister, who he's quite close with. And they're, they're saying, hey, why don't you just take your medicines, is what she's telling him. And he's feeling worse, so they bring him to the emergency department. On exam, other than being an AFib, he otherwise looks okay. But um, while in the hospital here, like I said, we go to the left heart cath, which I'll get to in a minute. He gets four total liters. His anion gap closes. His uh, DKA is resolved. Um, and he kind of ends up flipping from fib to flutter. And he gets, as well as a search from it, in addition to a surface echo, he also gets a transesophageal echo. So we can go into our echo here. Now, this is before the left heart cath. I actually show you, this is one day after the left heart cath, but 
uh, for sake of continuity, I'm just going to show it first. Our short axis view, short clip here, but I think you can see it does have some what looks to be anterior and anterior septal wall motion abnormality, as well as his EF doesn't appear to be normal anymore. Now we had an echo from three years prior, if you recall. That was normal. Okay. So we listed his EF as 30 to 35. We give him grade one diastolic dysfunction, as well as some wall motion abnormalities, but we said his RV was normal. Okay, so this is our left heart cath. I'm gonna kind of show more money shots here. Um, I'll let you all look at this a little bit. I'll play it again. Okay. Now you may have noticed, we actually found him have a coronary anomaly. So his LED and CERC have different takeoffs from the left side. So that first shot was his LED. Now we're shooting just his CERC. I'll play it again. Okay. Actually, this is nice. So let's me play them both at the same time. Okay. Now his right. And as you've seen so far, look like he had most prominently, you know, prox LED disease. We listed that as 90%. And you can see us starting to wire this, but he also had OM disease, which you can see. Well, and actually this is a cranial shot on this side. So we go from um, an LEO caudal to now a cranial shot. You don't really see the proximal disease as well in this view. But if you recall from the alien call shot, you did see it better. Okay. He ends up getting stents in his prox LED. And we sent him back to the CCU. Now, we did not FFR his RCA just for sake of time and for. Uh, a contrast actually. So the guy, the gentleman had an AKM, he came in and because we intervened on his LAD, we said we'd come back and we'd check his RCA at a later time. Like I said, our, our results here, he had a several osteo for his LAD and his uh, CERC, prox LED disease, uh, as well as mid, and then his OM disease. And then we noted some diseases at RCA, which we were going to come back to. Two stents in his LAD. However, when he comes back three days later for his left heart cath, the second one, just to do the FFR of his RCA, he develops a heart block, complete heart block, which brings us more into why I'm doing this case. So here's his post uh, cath EKG. And as you can see, our P waves mostly march out here. Um, but that they're not associated with his, uh, with his ventricular beats. Otherwise, still relatively the same morphology. So he's got what appears to be a stable um, escape beat for him. So he gets his second left heart cath. And really, all we do is use 60 of adenosine, get his FFR, which was normal. Uh, and then we cross his valve to try to get another LV EDP. The reason we did that is during his hospitalization, if you recall early, I mean, he was getting quite a bit of fluid uh, for management of his DKA. And then he actually started developing more signs of heart failure. So we were going to check an LV EDP for them. However, in the process of crossing that valve, we cause a complete heart block. And we end up waiting five days. We wait five days uh, to see if there's any improvement in his heart block and it doesn't improve. He does have a small groin hematoma uh, with no pseudoaneurysm. Uh, we held his heparin uh, after that. Okay, this kind of jumps into where I started learning a lot more about conduction anatomy. 
This is a phenomenal structural review paper uh, that I would say I attribute to really my learning on this anatomy uh, leading up to this talk. And just for review, uh, we'll just go through kind of the adduction anatomy, then we'll dig into the most important pieces for our case here. So our SA node is at the junction of the SVC and the crystal terminalis in the right atrium. Then we have our three internodal pathways, the middle, posterior, and right. Then we get into our AV node. The AV node being at the tip of the triangular cup, which is made of the borders of the annulus of the tricuspid valve, coronary sinus, and the tendon of the dara. From the AV node, our His bundle, our common AV bundle, courses towards the membranous septum. When it reaches the membranous septum, it splits into our left and right bundles. We're going to come back to the left bundle. I'll briefly talk about the right for now. Right bundle obviously passes down the right side of the interventricular septum. This course is pretty interesting in that it goes kind of from more superficial to deeper into the muscular septum back into more superficial later on as it becomes the, Purkin the Purkinje fibers in the ventricle. The left bundle courses towards the membranous septum on the inferior border as it goes into the muscular ventricular septum. In this area is where it splits into the anterior and posterior fascicular branches. Again, then it courses down the left side of the ventricular septum until it becomes the Purkinje fibers. All this is actually pretty interesting because it's just inferior to the border or the margin of the non and right coronary cusp. So this really got me thinking is, that, well, how, how did we cause a complete heart block in this patient? Well, it had to have been when we crossed the valve uh, and then have been, been in close proximity to the membranous septum. We'll come back and we'll talk a little bit later on uh, different types of anatomic variants in this area for the left bundle uh, and how that gives you different types of risk depending on the procedure that we're doing. Um, but this is most of the relevant anatomy. We're gonna talk a little bit about anatomic sensitivity. Now this first study, very an old study, uh, over a hundred years old, but it was an animal study where these folks were basically trying to understand the conduction anatomy. And it's referenced multiple times in subsequent studies, one of which I was really used a lot was this circ circulation uh, from 66. And they talk about um, in their dog model that they were doing several things to the conduction anatomy, see what happened. And one of the things was if they just simply stroked across it with the blunt edge of the knife, that they could cause a transient right bundle. And I think this is actually pretty interesting because then they go on in the circulation paper to suggest that a single touch of a catheter tip could cause an intrahist bundle injury. And I think that's really what happened in this case. Catheter tip or the side of the catheter simply touched where the bundle was, which brings up another point that I mentioned I'd come back to, which is kind of some differences in the anatomy of that left bundle. In that same structural paper that I told you about, there's an interesting concept that they were talking about with this naked AV bundle. And what it comes down to is in over 100 cadaver hearts and another paper, they were looking at differences in conduction anatomy. And what they found is that most people, there's around 46% of them, had the anatomy where the, the common left bundle before it splits into the anterior and posterior vesicular blocks tends to be um, on the inferior margin of the membranous septum where it goes into the muscular septum and is more covered by both fibrous tissue and muscular tissue. So in a way, it's more protective. However, there's a, another segment, and it's about it's it's about 20% or so um, that is more superficial. And this is effectively just under the endocardium and is a lot more exposed. So they call it a naked AV bundle. I think this is an interesting subset of people to where they're, they're quite um, at risk of uh, bundle injury. And we could go on to presume then too, if they have a baseline right bundle, then if this were to be interfered with, then they would have complete heart block. Um, so depending on kind of their normal anatomy, it does their bundle uh, course deeply? Does it course superficially? Um, as well as, which we'll come back to again later too, the, the links of their membranous septums uh, puts them at risk of 
bundle injury with various types of procedures, particularly those that in involve us uh, manipulating or putting devices near that membranous septum. Now, this would obviously go in conjunction with, uh, conjunction with baseline risk factors for conduction disease. So people who come to our cath lab or um, we're going to be intervening with who have baseline conduction disease, they're obviously at higher risk. In this case, someone who's undergoing a left-sided procedure, if they have a baseline right bundle, and we interfere or uh, manipulate around the area of the left bundle, then they're certainly at risk of a complete heart block. Uh, and then just otherwise, their risk of conduction disease at baseline. Are they older? This gentleman was only 64, but he did have diabetes. He was an obese man, um, and he did end up having a component of CKD. So other risk factors just for uh, baseline conduction disease. So like I mentioned, I'm proposing that our patient's mechanism of action and when we went through for the second left heart cath, we used a JR4. So this is a JR4 uh, that I've put in here. Now, either really one of two things, I think. One, when we came through the valve and tried to cross it to get his LVEDP, one part of the, the catheter was just bumped up against that segment of the membrane septum. Or perhaps the catheter could have been turned in a way we wouldn't have anticipated with the catheter tip facing towards that septum and it scraped across. Unclear which one. Um, but either one of these, I think, could be a suitable mechanism to simply touch and cause injury to uh, his left bundle. Now I'm going to start jumping into kind of a variety of rates and conduction abnormalities for different procedures. I did this because in the case of complete heart block with a routine left heart cath for someone who we just crossed the valve is very low. As you see there, they list this as maybe 0.1%. And I bring this up because for the most part, um, there's, there's not much data for me to show. I have lots of case reports, uh, some case studies, and then two cases from myself uh, here at the VA. And I'm putting this rate at about 0.1%. I chose that number because that's the number we use for uh, arrhythmias with Left heart cath, during our consensus is the number we use. I would say that the PBM uh, rate would be less than that, but I don't really have a great number for it. However, there are other procedures that give me better data um, that I'll come to. So the proposed mechanism in this case was just local trauma and then edema. And I'll come back to the edema point uh, as we start talking about resolution. Um, and I'll jump down to right heart cath here. And this, there's actually a fair bit more um, studies that I was able to use, and they put this rate of a conduction abnormality during the procedure as being higher, somewhere between 6 and 12 percent. Most of these are transient and resolve with permanent pacemaker rate again, of maybe 0.1 percent, though I would suggest it's probably less than that. Again, same mechanism, edema, local trauma from the catheter. The next two procedures uh, have a lot more data. In fact, the septal relations have way more data for me to follow, so I'll come to that one last. But the rotational atherectomy, we're going to talk briefly about a study that compared orbital and rotational atherectomies, and they put the rotational atherectomy rate of conduction abnormalities about 3%. However, again, the pacemaker rate, they don't comment on, but was quite low. In this case, I will say, again, maybe 0.1%. Mechanism different, though. Mostly, they talk about transient microvascular ischemia, and they go to talk about um, whether this would be uh, in a RCA or dominant left cert where you have, um, or, and also in a case where if you're doing rota in a vessel that's calcified, obviously, and provides collaterals to another area and you do the rota and then that could send off, you know, downstream embolization causing the transient microvascular ischemia, then leading to your conduction abnormalities. And then they also mentioned an adenosine type mechanism where damaged cells give off adenosine and it goes and binds to A1 receptors in the SA and AV node, giving you negative chronotropic and thromotropic effects. And then this central ablation. Now, this one was pretty interesting. There was a, a lot of data on this and they give uh, a really nice figure that I'm going to get to that shows a transient rate of about 24% and then a permanent pacemaker rate of about 10 to 12%. 
And these people were uh, high risk transient patients who they were worried perhaps would come back or people who had permanent need for uh, a pacemaker. The proposed mechanism is a little different. Obviously, because we're using alcohol to cause a localized infarction, it was both the infarction acutely as well as through time and the development of fibrosis, uh, as well as still local edema, but mostly infarction and fibrosis in this case, causing the conduction abnormality. So we're gonna jump in a little bit to some of these case reports. Now, this is that older article that I mentioned, as well as one other. And these cases mostly had, you know, both right and left heart casts. And as you can see, every patient had baseline conduction disease. And in, in most of these cases, where this is a uh, left heart cath. These are three right heart caths, um, or four, excuse me, and then followed by a left heart cath case. And when they have conduction disease opposite to the area with which we're intervening on, these patients developed a uh, complete heart block. Now, the first case, it was with a pigtail. They prolapsed it into the LV. The patient went to the AV block. Um, however, they Remove the catheter, finish the procedure, um, and the, the complete heart actually resolved. However, when the patient went to the CCU, it came back, and they ended up requiring a permanent pacemaker once they got their cabbage procedure. The next four are all right heart cath related heart blocks with a patient who had baseline left bundles, and they have varying degrees of either resolution or pacemaker requirement. The first, excuse me, the first one had 20 minutes asystole and they required a TVP. Uh, but when they removed the catheter, the normal sinus rhythm resolved or returned. The next one was only 10 seconds of asystole. The patient got CPR. Um, and then when the catheter was removed, within two minutes, normal sinus rhythm resolved. The third case, um, similarly, complete heart block during a right heart cath. They had a TVP already during the case. They pulled the catheter back. And then normal sinus rhythm returned. They actually put the catheter back in place and went and finished the right heart cath. No other issues. And then they had a patient who had 10 seconds of asystole, removed the catheter, um, and the patient subsequently went into a two to one AV block, followed by eventually normal sinus rhythm. Then we have a, a left heart cath, patient with a baseline right bundle, and uh, they removed the catheter, normal sinus rhythm, after two minutes, now this patient got a TVP, was turned on, they already had one in place. They had isoproteranol and CPR before this returned. However, I have one more case. Uh, and this was actually another case that I was involved in. It was a gentleman who had baseline EKG changes of a nonspecific ventricular conduction lay and a left anterior uh, or left axis deviation, excuse me. Um, and he came in for a planned PCI with Impella. When the impella was actually placed, that's when the gentleman immediately went to a complete heart block. Now, we didn't have a TVP in place, but we just turned the impella on. The patient was fine and gave us enough time, which was three minutes, to gain femoral venous access and place a TVP. However, at the end of the case, we pulled the devices out, and the patient actually still had asystole. So we had to turn the impella back on and we put in a right IJ TVP with planned discussion for permanent pacemaker. Uh, unfortunately, this was a Friday afternoon at about 3.34 o'clock. The patient didn't get a pacemaker or a temp perm uh, Friday evening. And then unfortunately a day later he lost capture and subsequently died actually. So this was kind of more fire for me to wanna do this case because I wanted to learn more about uh, this mechanism. So back into the septal ablations, various rates listed here for permanent pacemaker implantation. This shows several studies with rates ranging from seven to 17%. If you recall, the, the study that I'm gonna show next was a permanent pacemaker rate of about 10 to 12%. This shows actually a really nice figure for complete heart block through time in these people. They said that most patients 75% did not require or have any issues with conduction disease during the procedure after procedure, 75%. However, about 24% had some type 
of conduction abnormality, whether it persistent or transient after the alcohol subfibrillation with 10% requirement per pacemaker. And what they found is that for the most part, all of these patients had this presentation within 72 hours. So that's actually what they suggest too. Then if you can, you see a patient, you monitor them for three days after this procedure, you should know whether or not they're gonna have uh, an issue with complete heart block. We'll talk again about the rotational atherectomy. If you recall, I told you this was quite a large study, you know, 77,000 patients that they had in this and they were looking at orbital versus rotational atherectomy, but they put this as a risk of about 3%, which is why I uh, used that stat, uh, stat earlier. Okay. We're gonna talk now a little bit about some structural cases. Now, I think this was a, an interesting caveat for me because it allowed me to kind of, again, review the relevant anatomy. And so the rates of these, there's quite a big range here. And the range, when you, when you look at the studies that I was using the, the several reviews, they talk about the reason the range is so large because it really depends on the type of uh, device they used how old the valve was, was it a balloon inflated or a self-inflated balloon? Um, but that they overall put a rate of about five to 65%. With a permanent pacemaker requirement of say somewhere between five and 33%. Either way, we can see that this is clearly higher than uh, the other procedures I just went through. Mechanism, mechanical trauma, compression's a new one here, and edema, um, which we'll come to anatomically again. But if you recall, I mentioned the length of the membranous septum, which we'll come to, uh, and in reference to where the left bundle, particularly the common left bundle, uh, is located, and whether or not this could be a naked or, say, uh, protected common left bundle. Now, this ASD VSD closure, this is an interesting one too. Um, I will not say that I'm uh, an expert in congenital heart disease, but it actually makes a lot of sense anatomically then if we have a VSD or an ASD, depending on where specifically the, the defect is or how big it is, then we can assume then how big our device would have to be and its proximity to the conduction anatomy. So then sizing, proximity to anatomy, and then compression and edema, again, being our proposed mechanisms. And they put this as a relatively low rate of one to 5%. Back to the TAVR. I mentioned the membranous septum length. Now, this was a study basically looking at the risk of patients who required or who developed uh, conduction abnormality following a TAVR. And they used uh, CT scans, actually preoperative CT scans to try to uh, determine you know, the risk of patients requiring heart blocker having uh, the abnormality develop. And what they found was actually they came to membranous septum length with an inverse relationship with the rates of AV block, as well as the difference between implantation depth and the membranous septum length. So with a shorter membranous septum, the risk was significantly higher. And with a shorter difference between the implantation depth and the membranous septum, there was a higher risk. So if you have a longer membranous septum, your risk will be lower. If you have a greater difference between uh, the implantation depth and membrane septum, your risk will be lower. And I think this actually makes a lot of sense since we know that once the common bundle, the bundle of his comes from the AV node and courses towards the membrane septum and then to split into left and right at the inferior border of the membrane septum for most patients, then if that is further away from the annulus of the aortic valve when they put in that valve and they have their balloon come across, we should be further away from the conduction anatomy, thus bringing our risk lower. However, if that membrane septum is shorter, then the proximity would be closer. Um, and if, for instance, the patient was the unlucky person who had a naked bundle, then they would always also be at even higher risk of proximity damage. This uh, is one of the CT figures that overlies this cartoon. I think it's quite nice. Again, kind of telling us where the membranous septum is and then where we can expect our common His bundle to then split in left and right bundles. And you can see right there at the inferior border of the membranous septum as it becomes the muscular septum. 
is where it's located. So if that distance is shorter again, then our proximity to the annulus is <coughs> closer and thus at higher risk. This figure, again, from that same structural review paper is, is really nice. It gives us a couple ideas of both ASD and VSD proximity to our conduction anatomy. And so for an ASD, we can see, okay, here's our where the fossa ovala should be. Our ASD is here. And in this case, the proximity between that anterior inferior rim of this defect as what, to the AV node is, is pretty small. So when we put in our occlusion device, you can see in this case, it's overlying the AV node. And this person would be at risk of complete heart block, in this case, at the AV node. Whereas during uh, this case, for a membranous VSD, the common bundle actually has to course underneath that as it then splits at the inferior border of what would normally have been the connection between the membranous septum and the um, muscular ventricular septum. When we put our closure device into again, it's right over the common bundle. Um, so it would make sense then that this would be at risk for a conduction abnormality. All right. Now, I'd like to talk briefly about the surgical pacemaker rate. Now, I, I don't admit to be a, an expert in, such, uh, in surgical technique, but again, these make sense. And I think it's uh, helpful for just continuity between the case. In this case, we have pretty low rates for cabbage. They list as less than 1%. And the mechanisms here are a little different. They, they, they suggest inadequate myocardial protection as well as bypass and cross clamp time. And then for valvular replacements, aortic valve and uh, MVRs, they say the risk is, some, is higher, somewhere between six and 8.5%. Again, mechanical trauma in the area, edema, cross clamp time. I don't list it here, but they also suggest now the risk for tricuspid valve intervention is significantly higher. I mean, the number may be even as high as 40%, it's very high. And I think that again, makes a lot of sense. I mean, when they're intervening on the aortic valve, the annulus is above the conduction anatomy, whereas when they're intervening on the tricuspid valve, they're right there at it. I mean, if the triangle coach is created with the annulus of the tricuspid valve on one side, and that's right beside the AV node, then when they cut that valve out and they put in a new valve or they throw a stitch in, if the stitch were just in the wrong area, we can assume then that they would cause damage to that AV node, not even to mention the fact of like post-surgical edema and inflammation. So it makes a lot of sense. Septal myectomies, their rates are lower, roughly 4.4%. Now, if you recall, the alcohol septalation rate was around 10%. So this is really the main difference between our, our procedure, the alcohol septalation and the septal myectomy for our Hoakland patients. And in this case, it's clearly just mechanical trauma um, and edema. Though I think it's interesting then to then think back of difference mechanistically, if the alcohol septalization mechanism is not only acute, but um, through time infarction from the alcohol, we also have um, fibrosis there. Well, in this case, it's really, they're going in and they're, they're cutting out a piece of that myocardium. And so you have a trauma, you know, mechanical trauma immediately, as well as post-surgical edema and inflammation. So clearly a, a difference in mechanism there. Our guidelines tell us that these patients have a class one indication for pacemakers. I think what's really interesting for this is that they allude to, as what's, which we're gonna talk about a little bit later, being that they really put the onus on us to determine when, and they give us our discretion for determining that. And I think it comes down to really, you know, recovery. Um, when can we expect them to have a recovery? So what a lot of these studies are saying is that there's a period of time where people recover, whether that's uh, two minutes or if it's seven days or maybe it's five months, I don't know, but there's a period of time which recovers. And I would say that most on what most people were saying on here uh, in the reviews, as well as I've polled some of our electrophysiologists, it seems like most folks wait about five days, if not seven, before they put the permanent placemaker uh, in for these people. 
knowing that, you know, they may put it in at five days and it recovers a day later, or they may put it in at five days and it recovers five months later. But um, it kind of becomes in a, a, an issue of resources. How long is the patient going to sit in the hospital or in the ICU uh, awaiting potential recovery before we just put in a pacemaker and allow that patient to get back to their life? Um, but like I said, this specific indication is actually post cardiac surgery. And then we kind of can put that down as uh, using it for our other procedures as well. <clears throat> so I've multiple times alluded to spontaneous recovery and the guidelines I just told you give us uh, free reign to decide when we should be putting in our pacemakers. In this case, in the guidelines too, they specifically give us that because they say there's a variable history of recovery following, and say cardiac surgery, but also like I just told you regarding cath. Um, and there was one like case report that I alluded to being that there was recovery five months after pacemaker implantation. Some anecdotal data being that some of our own EP folks have had patients that they put in a pacemaker in and it resolves the next day. Or you check them and they went from having complete asystole and the 100% requirement of pacing with the pacemaker to then have no pacing requirement you know, months later and maintained through time over years of follow-up. And I think for these people who resolve, it's probably related to local tissue edema and inflammation. And I don't know that anyone can really predict how long that mechanism is gonna last, but I think we can assume for people who have you know, larger procedures, um, then that's probably more local edema as opposed to someone who has you know, just a little bit, I don't know how to predict that, or someone who has, say, baseline conduction disease and a lot of risk factors for having developed more of that over time, we may not expect them to improve then, being that the natural history and course of conduction disease is to get worse. Perhaps these people would have developed in any way, and thus we kind of push them over the edge and they don't come back. Or perhaps they do improve and then they have the heart block come back again over time. Which brings me to some ideas on mitigation strategies, and I'll kind of break this down by procedures. So if we're going to anticipate risk uh, and try to not cause harm, then perhaps we look at our baseline patients and say they have baseline conduction disease and we're doing a procedure that may be at risk, say, for instance, rotational atherectomy of the RCA um, or a TAVR, then maybe we should be thinking more about a TVP placement. I bring up rotational atherectomy because previously it seemed to be more commonplace to then use TVPs in this patient, but that over time we've used it left often, specifically because technique has changed, uh, whether that be speed, duration of, of burr, uh, or actually the burr size as well. All these things I think we have adjusted over time, as well as we found that it's actually quite effective to use, say, uh, a mechanical maneuver like coughing or just giving transient um, meds, let's say like atropine or theophylline infusions to get us through what is just going to be a transient uh, conduction abnormality um, and get to the procedure. As well as maybe minimize unnecessary manipulation of catheters if we're doing a right heart cath or someone who has a left bundle, um, then we would maybe try to be more, uh, we'll just try to <laughs> have less movement there. Um, and then for our alcohol septulations, they go to suggest a couple of things that over time, our rates of the complete heart blocks has actually gone down specifically because we've used less volume as well as uh, slower rates of infusion of the alcohol. Both of these things have helped as well as kind of anticipating risk. Like this is a big septal perforator that's perfusing a lot of area of myocardium and that person may be at higher risk or if it's you know, a high big um, perforator, then perhaps that person, we could knock out more of the conduction anatomy. Like I just mentioned with the rotational atherectomy, time, speed, and burst size. And then with our TAVR, device size, implantation depth, as well as radial force self versus balloon uh, expansion with self actually being higher risk. Um, and then in the use of TEE and pre-procedural CT, they go on to talk about this quite a bit, but I think it really comes down again to anatomy. If we know that the person has a short membrane in the septum and we're using a self-expanded valve, 
um, and there's going to be a small difference in implantation depth and membrane septum, then I think that's someone that we would already do it, but we'd probably play close attention during our TE guidance to put it in, you know, in the right position, but perhaps as high as we can safely uh, and or just have TVP prepared, um, which I think many of our structuralists do um, before we do this procedure. Back to our big case, this gentleman ended up getting a leadless pacemaker. It was placed about five days after our second left heart cath, at which point then we started Eliquis. Uh, we chose the leadless pacemaker in him despite his reduced EF and baseline conduction disease because of a couple of things. Now, while we admitted he may benefit from a CRT, um, we thought that because his EF was, I think, 35 to 40%, that while on GDMT, we can expect that perhaps he would have improvement in his EF, uh, as well as the fact that he had an A1C of 12 and had shown to have kind of poor medical adherence. So we were worried that he would actually have uh, more issues with surgical um, site closure and risk of infection. So that was delayed with the plan to come back at a later time and reevaluate. And if he would require CRT, we would do it at that time. Uh, and then if needed, remove that legalist pacemaker. Lastly, they did, we did remove his stitches and the patient was sent home uh, and it was feeling quite well. I want to thank Dr. Mavramatis and Dr. Hirsch both for both reviewing my slides and giving me some guidance on uh, what to dig into and maybe what to avoid. Um, I hope that I've done a good job in sharing this anatomy and many of these rates and relaying my interest and excitement by this case. Couple last minute take on points. I just wanna show that at least based on the number that I've shared, I think we can assume that this gentleman had a quite a rare uh, occurrence happen with his complete heart block just from crossing his valve. Significantly say less, more rare than say our structural and surgical cases. Many of these cases do resolve spontaneously and don't require a permanent pacemaker despite the procedure, whatever procedure we do. Though I, I don't know that I have a great explanation to how we can choose those people. And again, it's up to our discretion for when to put the pacemaker in because of this variable history. But I think that we should probably prepare for cases individually based on what their conduction anatomy is, uh, and then try to make uh, concessions to our procedural plan based on who they are. So that would take me to any questions for anyone. Hey, Billy Joe, good case, enjoyed that. Um, yeah, I guess the point is, yeah, it seems like for routine left heart cast, a permanent or a, a transvenous pacemaker certainly seems, you know, like overkill and probably more likely to cause harm than be useful in the vast majority of cases. But um, I guess the point is always be ready, right? Even for a routine, you know, left heart cast, just crossing the valve, et cetera, like, you know, be, be, vigilant and always prepared um, uh, for, for such an occurrence, um, uh, and including, you know, the staff and everything. The other thing I wanted to uh, bring, uh, bring up a point regarding um, alcohol septal ablations and heart block, something I do have some familiarity with. You know, you'd mentioned the permanent heart block uh, uh, rate is, you know, something uh, uh, around 12% for patients, you know, for long-term complete heart block after alcohol septal ablation. And that the, the temporary, you know, about, and about twice that for transient heart block or transient heart block being about the, the same. Um, the problem is, you know, we generally have to quote patients their rate of needing a pacemaker. And even those folks that have transient heart block that will resolve within several days after alcohol septal ablation usually end up with pacemakers. You know, patients don't usually, they don't care as much whether they're going to end up with transient heart block or complete heart block. They just care whether they're going to go home with a pacemaker or not. So that's why we generally quote a, a 20 to 25 percent pacemaker rate um, for uh, folks with alcohol septal ablation, which is, as you, as you mentioned, maybe four or five times higher than you would see with surgical myectomy. So, yes, sir. Other questions from the group? Hey, Robbie, Billy Joe. Yes, sir. Uh, thanks for reviewing that anatomy. You always can be reminded. Of of that anatomy very close to the membranous septum and uh, how the uh, AV node goes through there and how it divides into the bundle branches. Um, 
So that first tracing you showed that was irregular, uh, what what did you in the end think that was? The very first e the very first EKG that was sent to me, sir. The one that was irregular. That yeah. Yes, sir. So to this day, I, I still believe that it was uh, an AFib because this gentleman did not have AFib before, and then I didn't only I didn't show it except for one EKG. But once his rate slowed down, he did show that he was in AFib. And then when yep. his rate, and then throughout the days following, uh, for instance, two days later, he was still in AFib, though his uh, cure restoration had come further down, yep. closer to his baseline. Right. So you could, you could take his baseline tracing and give him hyperkalemia, and it might look like that. All those SCT changes were, I guess they were a combination thing, but they could be attributed to the conduction delay. Mm -hmm. and um, and the, the hyperkalemia, but that tracing afterwards when he had the no anterior forces and the T waves inverted was anterior injury, I guess. So that you is. had a lot of interesting tracings there. So I, I think you're right. I think that was probably atrial fib, hyperkalemia, and more conduction delay um, because of the hyperkalemia. That's that's what I thought too. Yeah, Again, I, think I, that's I wasn't right. a hundred percent confident in it, and I know that not all of these algorithms are perfect, um, but at least I felt the most comfortable with that one that only required me to really answer three questions, um, and then based on that one, I felt more confident that perhaps it was just in this case an AFib with aberrancy. Um, but at the time, well, thought, AFib with uh, that baseline incomplete right bundle branch block like tracing. Uh, with hyperkalemia might make it look like like that because mm -hmm. he had a, he had ischemia on top of that because they didn't tell you he had DKA and a K of six six point five initially I guess no so the only thing I knew about him like I said at first was that his K was elevated and it was uh, it was more that as we answer the initial question you know you know tensions go down that I'm able to you know do more reading and then obviously more of their labs were coming back and. Uh, that's why I presented the case the way I did, because right. this is kind of how it was presented to me. And then through the time course right. of the night, it's interesting. I actually wrote four addendums to my initial note on this guy because <laughs> I kept that was uh, good. checking back in on him. Um, so I, you, another choice of the amiodarone might have been a low dose of metoprolol IV and slowed him down a little bit to see what uh, he looked. But but with that potassium of 6.5, uh, hard to know what that might do. You know, it's, um, it's interesting that you bring that up because... This, this gentleman had many more learning points. For instance, if, if, we had, if I had more time, I could have dug into other things, but uh, other points being one, he actually ended up having a left atrial appendix thrombus. So that, that oh, was really? a key in the, in the or wrench in the plan. Now that wasn't determined until three days later, but he had that um, as well as his coronary anomaly. Um, I did some learning on amiodarone and hyperkalemia and hypokalemia. So they, this case had many, many different far reaching learning points. Um, but looking back, say, like, what could I have done differently? Well, I'm, I'm not really sure because his pressures were soft. So I was a little more hesitant to use the IV beta blocker, though perhaps a low dose would have been fine. Right. And then now hindsight 2020, maybe I yeah, should have used amiodarone because he had this left atrial appendix thrombus. And then I'll call you right back. And then he also had uh, the AKI, though he wasn't ESRD. So perhaps DIG would have been safer for him. Um, so maybe I could have used DIG. I'm not really sure. 100% sure, but it ended up working out fine. But I know I, at least in the short term, played with a little fire with him. Uh, but it, that part ended up working out fine. So uh, uh, anytime you go to the cath lab with someone that's got uh, left axis right bundle and their PR interval is even normal, and especially if it's a little longer, you jiggle the catheter much on the left side, you'll wind up with nothing but P waves. So. <laughs> Uh, I think probably you kind of hinted to that. Uh, that's personally happened to me a couple of times, and it's uh, something you kind of get ready for. Yeah. And uh, maybe even have a venous sheath, and if you need it, or have a pacemaker halfway up. But uh, I think that you know you bring that point up. And the case that I alluded to that didn't really dig into was the other complete heart block case I had, and that gentleman really fits exactly in that mold: right bundle or non-specific interventricular conduction delay and a left axis 
We put in the impella and then a systole, nothing but P waves. And we yeah. had to put in our venous sheath. We had to put in our TVP. Fortunately, he had an impella in place already. And then procedurally during the cath, he ended up being fine, but he did succumb to that two days later. But maybe, you know, we could take that from three minutes to say maybe five, 10 seconds if we already have a TVP in place uh, or, and then we can just turn it on. Like many of the other cases that I, case reports uh, that I talked about where several of those cases, at least half already had a TVP in place. So um, like you said, maybe just being proactive. Very good. Thank you so much for that great presentation. Any other questions, comments from the group? The other thing I'll just say, Billy Joe, I mean, and and I mean, it ended up being right, but I, I was always taught and always tell the house staff, you know, if you get one of these SVT with the Berency versus VT things, generally speaking, if it's not clear, assume it's VT, you know, until, until proven otherwise, and you'll generally be okay. But like you said, you know, the treatment seemed like at the time was amiodarone regardless. Um, uh, and it, and it, and it worked out. So, you know, it's, it's funny you bring that up and I know, I know we're running short on time, but I could actually hear this gentleman and this gentleman was kind of a sassy guy and several of my co-fellows met him. For instance, Bo Wong also met him and the guy had a lot of sass to him. And as I'm talking to the ED team and they're telling me his blood pressures, we're talking about treatment options. And I'm, and I'm like, Hey, look, if his pressures are low again, and he's still going fast, let's just cardiovert him. And I, and they're, they're talking and we're talking out loud and the patient heard us talking about shocking him and i could hear him being like oh no don't you shock me <laughs> so he, he wasn't excited about it unless we had to but that, that had obviously had been discussed but uh amiodarone ended up being what was chosen all right well yeah thank you again billy joe excellent case yeah really cool case and a good discussion on a a rare but certainly uh um you know uh, worrisome complication that, that that can occur in the cath lab so again thank you for that uh review and uh, excellent case so all right well uh everyone have a great friday and we'll see everybody next week the preceding program is copyrighted by emory university